again. So Mike Kibble is the reason why we are all here and we have started the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Regional Network. He um, started it sort of as a spin-off of the Wisconsin AAC Network. So if you've never been to a meeting, um, definitely check out the Wisconsin AAC Network um, webpage. It is linked in at the end of the um, slide deck. So um, Mike is an AAC user. He happens to be from my region, and, um, the Green Bay Fox Valley area. He's from the Appleton area. I'm from Green Bay. Um, and so we get to present at our water meetings together. Um, so thank you, Mike, for saying hello to everybody. I am Jennifer Schubert. I'm a speech language pathologist in the Green Bay area and part of um, the, I guess, Wisconsin AAC Network School Committee that um, kind of dreamt up this idea of having regional networks to support assistive technology throughout our state. Um, so um, on the first slide is the link, the bit.ly, um, as well as a QR code for the um, slides that we're using today. Um, you can um, definitely, I'll give you a second if you haven't already um, gone to the slides. And maybe Cassie can chat out that bit.ly in the chat. And um, we've had, this is our third WADA meeting for the year. These meetings have always been in person. Um, I think it's our idea originally, um, and um, if anybody else, uh, Sharon or Kelsey, if you want to chime in, um, Sharon, Kelsey, Mike, and I were the ones that kind of dreamt this up. And we, we liked the idea of having in-person meetings. Obviously, um, we can't do that right now. Um, and th there is a survey at the end. I'm, I think we're all very interested to see what everybody who's attending today thinks of this format. Um, we've been asked before to do a virtual meeting and um, it didn't kind of go along with our original vision of being able to meet locally um, and in person to really make those contacts with fellow assistive technology professionals throughout our state and especially in our regions. We don't always have um, have the opportunity to um, connect and so I guess that's why I like the in-person meetings um, but I know that we still have not been able to um, really hit the northern Wisconsin area with a regional leader um, so there's definitely a hole in that area and I do know that it's hard sometimes to get out of work and attend the meetings in person so I think we're looking for a little feedback on what everybody thinks of this new format today. Um, so we have Kelly Bonner presenting today, and I'm not sure what's going to happen with our summer meetings yet. Um, possibly another virtual meeting. Um, we had um, targeted seating and positioning for that meeting um, as our main topic to discuss. So um, definitely sign up for the meeting. Uh, that way you'll get notifications if you are interested and we'll keep you updated on if those meetings will happen in person or virtually. Um, but sign up and if you're from a, uh, an area of Wisconsin where you don't have a region, um, just sign up for one of them. That way we'll have your email address and you'll get updates on how we are gonna move forward with that summer meeting. And the QR code or the bit.ly for that is on the slide. Um, so the mission of WATER and why we started is really to provide a platform for assistive technology and AAC specialists around the state of Wisconsin. We wanted to be able to meet regionally in groups to provide each other support, share knowledge, raise awareness around current issues facing school-based assistive technology and AAC professionals. So this um, group is definitely targeted towards school-based services. Um, our vision was really just to foster a grassroots effort uh, to fill the gap that was left behind by the defunding of WADI. So that happened already like 15 years ago. It was a long time ago. We've had a lot of um, WADI members, former WADI members. I, I don't know, even want to say former because I still think you guys can all be WADI members. Um, but WADI members who've joined us in, in our vision and have been joining our meetings. We've have, we have some that are leading meetings, so that's been awesome. Um, but I think uh, with, you know, 
Act 10 in Wisconsin, we re have really seen a lot of people retire and take all of their knowledge with them. And so we have sort of this new generation of assistive technology professionals um, that didn't have the benefit of having WADI. And so I think that's why, um, you know, we feel WADERN or the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Regional Networks are so important so that we can still foster that learning um, for AT professionals throughout our state. Um, if you click on the link, it just tells you a little bit about our um, leadership team and who is running the meetings. Um, we're always looking for more people to host meetings and create a, a region. There isn't a lot uh, involved. We meet virtually to plan out our meetings um, and then really the you're just a facilitator. So you're just sort of orchestrating everything um, and answering questions, but you don't have to be an absolute expert in everything assistive technology um, because it, this is a group and um, we're really looking for that discussion piece and pulling in everybody's expertise. So if you are interested in hosting a meeting, reach out to any one of the leaders and um, we'll try to connect with you. So today we are really going to be talking about forming um, district-wide assistive technology team, um, supports that we can put in place to do that well, um, and if you already have a team, how you might want to improve what you already have. Um, and we're really hoping that some of you can share what's working well in your district um, and, and reflect on what we can do to support each other. Um, so I think we'll probably skip introductions and maybe just do that in our breakout sessions. Um, and maybe if we have time towards the end during our discussion time, um, we've already gone through our introduction of water. So next I'm going to throw it out to Kelly, who it was kind enough to volunteer her time. Um, she is also part of um, the Wisconsin AAC Network Leadership, and um, she is an amazing presenter. Um, she's done a lot in our field. I'm not even going to try to summarize everything I put in that slide, and there's probably way more that belongs on that slide as well. So thank you, Kelly, for your time. Thank you for doing this, and I'm going to throw it over to you. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. One point of you want to control the slides from your end because I have no control. Okay, great. That's fine with you. I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's good. Good. So hi, everybody. Um, I thought maybe we should start with the uh, jump around because um, our neighborhood's doing a jump around tomorrow <laughs> at three o'clock. And even though I never went to UW, my husband did. So like that's our, that's our new neighborhood thing. Everybody in their own driveways doing the jump around at three. Um, and as Jennifer was talking about, uh, former WADI, mem WADI members, um, Marsha Buckowitz, who is, used to work out of CESA 9, that was WADI, the WADI representative there, is a very big jump around person. So if you're on Facebook, look for her. It's, it's quite fun just to watch her and jump with her. Uh, so my name is Kelly Fawner. I do training and consulting in educational and assistive technologies. And big shout out to the people from the school districts here in the state that I work with. Um, I... My background is as a special education teacher. Prior to being a special ed teacher, I was a paraprofessional at an Easter Seals program in Philadelphia. So yes, I am not Wisconsin um, grown. Um, I've been here for 20 years though. I came to Wisconsin to the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee's graduate program um, to do my PhD with Dave Eddie Byrne when he was there um, and started my own business instead. So, <laughs> Dave always introduces me as the one grad student of his that never finished, but oh well, that's, that's the way life goes sometimes. Um, and in my um, workings as a special ed teacher, I've taught from early childhood through high school resource. Um, and then I have also worked with university students um, in Centers for Disability Services on campuses. In my um, last position in Pennsylvania before I moved here, I worked for the Department of Education in a project that was very similar to the Wadi project. Um, it's the Patan project, where I had 121 school districts um, that I was responsible for providing assistive technology services and supports for assessment and training and meetings and those kinds of things. So this is a very familiar um, territory to me. But I now do training 
I do training for some companies. I do training for just contract training on services. I'm a member of what we're talking about here today, and I'll have Jen click. Um, I'm a member of the Quiet Leadership Team. I'm actually the newest member on the team. Um, this is a group that's been together for almost 25 years since we, um, I, since assistive technology was written into IDEA in 1997, probably before some of you were born, um, or you were just cruising around your mom's coffee table, um, but that's all right. So the group of people that got quiet started uh, were from different states. There were some parents of kids with special needs. There were people from industry. And what they were looking at is how did we provide services, the services side of assistive technology. Because as you may know, in the federal definition, assistive technology is devices and services. And a lot of people come to assistive technology because of the tools. Um, they're very interested in the apps, um, the devices, and other components. But what we have learned over time, repeatedly over time, is that if you don't have your services into place, often the devices, the apps, the extensions, um, all get unused and abandoned. Um, so you'll see on some of these slides links to the quiet leadership team. There are 11 of us at this point. Um, and we're always looking for more people that would like to, it's all volunteer, just like the association here in Wisconsin. Um, everything we do is volunteering of our time and our own funds. So you'll have links there to everybody that's on the team um, and links to get um, any questions directly to us. So I'm going to go click. click. Um, the mission, as I started saying, the mission of, the, of QUIET was to improve services and to have some consistency across the country. Um, because what, one, like what Texas was doing wasn't what we were doing in Pennsylvania, what wasn't happening in Wisconsin. And so people like um, the original director of Wadi, Penny Reed, um, was on is, and is still on the quiet leadership team. And so she represented Wisconsin and what was happening here um, in the early developments of assistive technology in school systems. And of course, we're always looking at how we can stay within changes and legal mandates. So I'm going to share with you today some of the extension projects. So if you're somebody who's familiar with QUIET, and this is old hat to you, um, quite possibly you don't know about the 504 initiative or the QUIET PS for post-secondary. Um, I know Mike and I, Mike's supporting somebody right now that's going through the post-secondary um, services assessment. So we'll share that information with you too. Click, click. Um, you, this, I've already talked about this. It started back in the 90s. There we go. Grassroots people from, and it still continues. We have people on our team that are consultants like me. We have people that work in school districts. Um, we have teachers, we have SLPs, we have parents, um, we have OT, we have a manufacturer rep. So it's a wide variety of people that are on the leadership committee. Um, the people who benefit from QUIET, mostly we hear from people from school districts. And I shouldn't say we, because QUIET is um, the QUIET Consortium, which at this point is over 5,000 people internationally. We have people from Australia, from Canada, from some of the European countries that are a portion, oh, and, and then somebody from Japan, um, that are part of the QUIET um, Consortium online. Um, the leadership team, takes information that comes from the consortium and puts it, kind of packages it together. We're responsible for taking care of the website. Um, and I'll talk about the list um, that's always ongoing. And some people here are on that list and really great, valuable members to our list. Um, so what we do see um, people who try to take advantage, um, that's the right word, that um, use the services, of QUIET that are teaching assistive technology in universities. We've had people from state departments of education that have followed the QUIET process with the indicators that we're gonna be talking about this morning. Um, so they've been used, they've been researched, they are in multiple, referenced in multiple books um, on special education technology services. And so, 
you know, what we're sharing are things not that 11 people got together 20 some years ago and made up, but was worked on by hundreds of people. Before I was a member of the leadership team, I used to go to the summits that were happening every other summer where these indicators were developed. Click, click. <laughs> um, I've been talking about the quiet indicators. And so what the original group looked at it was, what are the indicators that you are providing quality services in assistive technology? And um, originally they came up with six different areas everywhere from including assistive technology in the IEP to evaluation of effectiveness. And then over time, they added transition and professional development, making sure that assistive technology, what were the indicators of quality provision of services in those areas? Um, the six original areas were um, validated in Joy Zabala's doctoral program at the University of Kentucky. Um, in 2004, um, and over 95, almost 100 professionals participated in validating those areas. Um, and then her dissertation was written on that. Um, and then each over time applicators were developed. The, um, and here are, oh, thank you, Jennifer. Here are the eight areas. Um, so it's the consideration of assistive technology, assessment of AT, including AT in the IEP and the IFSP, um, and then transition plans, um, implementation of assistive technology, evaluation of effectiveness, transition, administrative support, um, and professional development. Each of these eight areas, I'll go click, click. Each of these eight areas has a title, it has an overview of that area, and all of this is free information up on the QUIET website, which is just QIAT.org. And I'm gonna take you there um, and kind of sh sh show you around it, but go ahead and you know take a look while I'm chatting you up. Um, and so each of the areas of those eight areas has, has statements that school systems or service providers of any kind can measure yourself up against. Where are you? And so rather than do we do this or we do not do this, what was developed over time were some common errors that people make in different areas, and then a set of matrices. Um, and we're gonna take a look, I, these documents are gonna be all linked um, to the presentation, So, but you can go and download them as well. So go ahead and click. Um, there are some assumptions across all eight areas, so we didn't have to repeat them and repeat them and repeat them in each section of the website. But, um, you know, these are the common things that kind of were held the indicators together, that assistive technology requires ongoing and collaborative work. It isn't a one-shot um, expert model. Um, that we need to respect the ethical practices, of ASHA, AOTA, um, educators, all the people that come to the process of assistive technology and what those practices are in our various um, overseeing organizations. Um, we look at that your you know, certifications are through. We look to make sure that they continue to be legally correct and aligned. Sometimes people, um, try to rewrite the indicators, but what they're real, not always realizing is that we have to make sure not only legally aligned federally, but they have to be legally aligned in all of the states um, across the US. So, and those, and sometimes what one state might add to their educational protocols for assistive technology might not exist in another part. Um, so you, we look at this every year it goes through I know, are we still aligned that way? Um, and then also we're looking at, can they be used in different service deliveries? So in K-12 schooling, in an early intervention services, as I mentioned, as kids move up post-secondary, um, we'll see some of the changes that have happened to that. This is a, a link to the indicator portion of the website um, and just a view of 
what's there for you. So the quality indicators each have either an MS Word or PDF files to download of all of those things that I've just mentioned, the description, the indicators, the common errors. And then for each area, there's also one of these matrices. So I'm going to have Jen stop sharing and I'm going to take over at the screen <laughs> and um, go to the quiet website. So here on the home page, I'll just do a double check that everybody's seeing this. Thumbs up, Jen, if you see it. Yeah, great. Um, and so this is the landing page for quiet, um, just to kind of give you the general information um, and information about where things have come from. There also over the last five years, we were asked by um, university professors to put all of this information together in a book. Um, and so you'll see links to that book and there's a smaller version of the book and it just has everything from the website. And then we've added to it case studies, study guides. Um, the state of Oregon um, and some other places run some study guides on using the quality indicators in your service if you're interested in really digging in. Um, one of our members, uh, Gail Bowser, also um, runs an online course with a colleague of hers, um, Denise DeCoast, who's out of Maryland. And I know that some of you have been taking that course and you work through all the different indicators and in improving your services. Very nice, Jen, good luck. And then the, um, this is the, the shortened version. <laughs> The quiet companion, they call it. And Gail, if I'm like I'm giving some kind of promo here. I should give the qualifier that yes, I am one of the authors of those two books. Yes, I do receive um, royalties. Maybe you know um, Joan Breslin Larson always says maybe you could buy a pair of shoes in two years with what we get. So there you go. <laughs> not, we're not driving a private airplanes um, from this. So the indicators, as I, from the screenshot you just saw, are listed, or you know, the links to all of them are here. As you scroll down, you'll see the separate indicators and the matrices. I'm gonna pull one up. These are the, a look at the matrices. So each of the areas, la 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 la, la all the references. So for example, here is, consideration of assistive technology needs. Down the left-hand side are the quality indicator statements. Um, and the things in underline are kind of the key components of the statement. And then this is kind of a, a practicing matrix so that um, the one through five is, what does it look like if you're not doing this at all? So assistive technology devices and services are considered for all students, regardless of type or severity of disability. You know, if you are not doing that at all, you would score yourself as a one. As you reckon, if you recognize some kids with disabilities in assistive technology, you'll see that it slides you up to what the promising practice is. Um, when I work with my teams, I'm always telling you not everybody's a five. Um, and sometimes what's been interesting as full states have done these, um, we've done them in Minnesota and Texas and Arizona, um, as people score themselves at first, kind of in like a baseline measurement of where you might be, as you learn more about assistive technology, you know, what you know, that you, or what you didn't know that you didn't know, but as you know more about it, sometimes people's scores will actually lower because they're more aware of what's involved in providing assistive technology services. So some other examples of indicators in this area is, um, you know, where is the, the beginnings of, are you including assistive technology in the IEP? There's a whole indicator, seven indicators that are about quality IEP writing. Um, that members, and, when, and one of the assumptions is when we talk about members, it's not just school staff, this is family members as, you know, as a part of the process, as well as the student themselves. 
um, that they work in a collaborative, collective, knowledgeable, and skills needed to inform assistive technology services so that you've got some people that are informed. You are looking at providing services throughout the school day to all things that connect um, assistive technology, that you gather data, and then there's a whole set of indicators on evaluation of effectiveness so that you can look at the data that you're gathering or how even to gather data. Um, if you are exploring a range of systems, you're, you're not just buying the same thing for everybody else. Um, everybody gets the same thing no matter what. Um, and then is the consideration process documented? Um, and you'll find this idea of documentation as another theme throughout all of the areas. Not just does one person know it, then they talk you through it, but can people find on your school system website? Can they find in a handout that you can email to them what it is that you do in all of these different areas? What timelines look like and what are the expectations? Because otherwise, one of the big things that can people complain about in assistive technology is the mystery of the service delivery model. Um, and so we try to look in the indicators that um, you're writing these things down. And again, for all eight areas, you will find these matrices. And if this is a process that's new to you, it may be one of the things to download and then take a look at it. Sometimes within a school system, if you have multiple people that are providing different types of AT services, you come together and collectively fill this out. We've also had school systems where everybody fills it out individually and then you come together and compare where you think you might be um, in assistive technology within your system. So those are the matrices. Um, one of the big things that people often find out about QUIET first is that there is a list. Um, and it's an ongoing, it goes on like a listserv through email. Um, and we have over 5,000 members right now that are on this list. So it's a busy list. Um, I probably get, we, we probably get about 20 emails a day that come out to everybody on the list. We do have some, um, if I click on here, there are some guidelines for the list. We try to have people not just say thank you <laughs> or just like one word. Um, we'll try and give content. There's a lot of question asking that goes on the list about you know, I have a student who needs a writing tool, or I have a student that needs an AAC system who uses these kinds of symbols. When you ask those kinds of questions on the list, the more information that you can give the people on the list, the more quality responses you'll get. Because sometimes we've had people say, you know, I have a kid with autism, what AT should I buy them? Okay, well, like, <laughs> where do you want me to start? Um, and instead of the tools being tied to the disability, the tools need to be tied to the function. So we try to practice good feedback and say, well, what are you looking for? Because otherwise, all you're going to get in responses is, is people's favorite things. Like, oh, we like this, and we like this, and we like this. Well, that's not going to help you in your decision making. It's just going to give you a bigger list of things to look through. So um, look through some of the FAQs about the list. You can join the list, you can get your, you know, leave the list. You don't need any of us um, to do that for you. But the, one of the nice resort, re, um, resources that's come from the list is people have been sharing documents that they've created for their school system. So you can go back and you can search the archives even without joining the list. So you can go in, put in a search term, and see what kinds of documents people might be using in their assessment process or in their services. How do people get your services? And many of those are in the resource bank. So you'll find in the resource bank, one of the things that we are currently working on is um, a new with a new design company um, because some of the features right now that were created, the, this original website was done um, free of charge by an organization that was learning about making web accessible designs. 
And what we have found over time is that there are definitely pieces that are not accessible. So we are um, contracting with a web accessibility individual who's going to be redesigning it. And one of the things that's getting redesigned is this resource document uh, bank. So because right now you just kind of have to search through it. It's just a linear. Um, so it's not really alphabetical or in any kind of groupings, but we're probably going to be grouping them based upon um, the indicators. But I have found some really um, good sources in here. There's people that have put behavioral logs, um, AAC language sampling guides, um, and other great things that, you know, their consideration process, um, pre they'll put presentations so that you don't always have to make everything from scratch. Um, I think so often we, we start all over again because we think we're the only one and we really aren't. There's a lot of us out there. There's a lot of us out there. Um, and then there's always a place for announcements and then information on getting to the team, who everybody is, they're all, all their emails and those kinds of things. So that's the website. I am going to stop sharing. Unless people have questions on the website, I should probably stay here and check that out first. Kelly, if you just want to control the PowerPoint too, it looks like you have it up. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, great. Any questions on the website at all? I didn't see any specifically so far. Nothing's okay. coming up specific to the website, Kelly. All right, great. Well, let's see if I can get us to where we left off. Ah, wrong. Clicky, clicky. I had to move everybody's heads to click on my screen. All right, so are we good here? Cassie, thumbs up if we, all right, great. So um, that's kind of quiet in a nutshell, like as fast as I could go through it. Trust me, if all 11 of us were here, this would be two hours long. <laughs> so we just kind of compact it all together for you there. For me, as um, an AT professional, it's been really helpful to use those matrices with the places that I work with. So uh, we can look at what thing, where are your strengths? Where are the things that you need to be brought up to strengthen? Um, and it can help you guide your professional development and assistive technology. When it all seems so overwhelming, it can provide you with direction um, for what you might need to look into next. And because Quiet's been around for almost, you know, 25 years, there have been other projects around the United States that have taken the indicators and changed them up for their particular group. Um, and so that we call those the expansion projects. Um, one of them is the post-secondary project, so called Quiet PS, and you've got the link here for them. Um, and in Quiet Post-Secondary, what they've looked at is how do the assistive technology indicators relate to students who go on to um, technical school, to colleges, and to universities. Um, and there is a set of indicators that they've adjusted. They're built off of the original eight, um, but they're definitely um, set up for students with disabilities on campuses, um, looking at you know, planning and implementation, making sure the data is collected, and as they maybe decide to use some new assistive technologies that it's based upon some trials. Um, looking at, again, administrative support, such an important issue. For those of you, um, even if it's not post-secondary, back, you know, in K-12 or early intervention services, uh, Dr. Penny Reed and Gail Bowser have worked together um, on the quiet indicators for administration over the years. And you'll see the matrices to those right off of the quiet website. But they really look at, you know, how do you get your administrator to support you? And they've kind of gone to the whole process and done a book on called Leading the Way, um, Leading the Way to Excellence in Assistive Technology Services. Um, so they put that together, they teach 
um, courses online to specifically to administrators. Um, they'll do one hour and two hour webinars and I'll show you some links to those. One of the things that I use off of Quiet PS the most um, is the evaluation. Um, and so campuses can evaluate themselves or students on campus that are going to campus can evaluate where they are in the process. So when you go to the Quiet PS website, there are two distinct portions. There is the student side and the campus side. Um, and then when you click and move forward on that um, within there, you'll run into the matrices are electronic on the Quiet PS site. They're, um, I think you can print out a document, but they are also electronic so that they can be filled out through assistive technology means more easily um, to slide from the one to five scale. The, one of the other projects that's been done is um, looking at students that have 504 plans because the original eight indicators were really tied to IDEA and students with IEPs. Um, and so Aaron Marsters, who is um, one of the assistive technology professionals that serves students and families that are in DOD schools, Department of Defense schools across the world, um, really has a lot of students that have 504 plans that they're providing AT to, um, actually more of those than he has kids on IEPs. Um, and so Aaron worked with um, Gail Bowser over the last three years now to develop a set of indicators and you'll see the link to them right now exists on the Quiet PS website, um, but it will be a part of the renovation um, or the renewing of the uh, quiet.org website. We've also had a group in the University of Buffalo area that worked on a set of quiet indicators for early intervention services, and that was over 10 years ago. And just as um, Jennifer mentioned that when people retire, their knowledge goes with them. That's what happened to the quiet indicators with early intervention. They kind of got lost in retirements and job changing. So we do have one of our leadership team that's working to try and renew those indicators. And we're hoping that that will also be a part of the new website. Um, if you're ever interested, if you're an early intervention service provider, and that's something that you're interested in, send me an email. Um, and I'll link you up with our leadership team member that's working on the early intervention services. Um, so those, those are the extension plan, um, programs. And then these are basically all of the resources. You know, you've got the list that you can join, the website where you can get information from, the matrices that you can download and do self-evaluations with. Um, there are, in each of those indicator areas, there are um, planning documents that have been worked on by groups of people over the years, as well as that resource bank um, that's there. Kelly, we did have a question and you yeah. just mentioned it, so I'm going to bring it up. Somebody had said that their biggest question and hurdle is getting administration on board and how to help get them to support the need for an AT team in their district. So you just mentioned um, the quiet resources and I linked them into chat, but it, maybe you could show those and talk a little bit about how yes. they could just... So let me stop that. Oh, wait a minute, quit out of here. Go back to the quiet website. So I'm gonna go back to the indicators. That's the best way for me to kind of talk through this and make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, and in the matrices, I'm gonna go down to administrative support. So the things that we look at in this is that can you work with your administrator if say one of the things that I've done is to go through this set of matrices with your team and then when you get to this one with hey, Kelly, did you want to share your screen? Oh, sorry. That would be good. Yeah, that would be really good. Sharing screens would be great. All right, Zoom land. Um, so this is the administrative support set of matrices. 
And one of the things I was saying that can be very helpful to do to raise the level of awareness of your administrator, because often administrators, their awareness of the system technology is about money, right? How much we spend, how much, you know, the next subscri subscription is going to be, how much a device is for somebody. Um, they don't always understand the nuances of the service provision, what we have to do for assessment and trials, what we need to do for implementation and support as a follow-up service when somebody gets something that, you know, the issue isn't fixed just because you bought something for a kid. Um, and so one of the things in the indicators that we'll often do is if you as a team or you yourself, if you are, as I was in one of my places, the sole AT person um, in my system, went through the, the matrices. And when I got to the administrative one, I went to my building principal. I went to my administrator and said, you know, I'm providing assistive technology services to our school or our school system, or in my case, it was an Easter Seals program. Um, how can we um, go through all these? I need your help to fill out this part, you know, about what your awareness is about what I'm doing. Um, and so what uh, Doris and I went through was looking at you know, it, the, do we provide written procedures about what's going on in assistive technology? And at that time, we weren't. Um, and so it, she helped um, get me on a committee with people that would help write some of our procedures. So that started that process. So right from the very first indicator, she was like, wow, we need to be doing this. Um, and that, you know, not everybody's going to respond immediately like that. There were some she was less enthused about. But, you know, looking at um, how is our information uh, disseminated? Do you have links um, on your school district website for people to get to your services? Um, with some of the new students that I've been picking up during um, COVID-19 time at home, um, I've been going to their school district. You know, I, I, parents contact me. They want to know, you know, what can be done with the things that they have. So I'm always trying to connect back to their school system. And it's very difficult off of some school district web pages to find who the AT service people are. And it's not that you're just one person and that's all your job is, but who is, you know, carries a second and third hat of assistive technology. So just finding out that information and making that available to people within your own school system, as well as to the families who you're providing services to. Um, other kinds of things that are there for administrators, uh, it's got a lot to do with written descriptions. Um, um, also looking to make sure that there is personnel within the organization that has competencies in assistive technology. Are they making, are they giving you time to get professional development because that's one of your roles in the school system? Um, do you have a process? Are they thinking about it in budgeting? Um, one of the things I just met with our recent, um, my local school system, and they're very forward thinking and how are we getting um, the best AAC systems packaged in a way that we can um, you know, use our dollars and how we can use other monies that we're bringing in. Um, and so we had a whole half day meeting just on the funding process um, about two months ago. It was in February before when we were all allowed to be around the table. Um, and so that's very forward thinking of a small school system. Um, and, you know, looking at ongoing, again, ongoing learning opportunities, not just for the staff, not just for the AT providers, but of all of the educators in your system. Um, and how are you training family? How are you training students? Um, and so you'll see good things come from this. Um, I forgot to look at all who's joining us, but a shout out to Janesville schools. Um, it's one of the schools that I've been lucky to go and visit and, and work with them a little bit over the time. But you know, they'll do parent nights um, about AAC systems. And they'll have activities for parents to use their children's communication systems. Um, you know, they, they really have thought through the process of involving everybody in that and 
and how do we training doesn't have to be a full day sit down we are learning that now right it doesn't have to be the everybody all in the same room um, at the same time you know some tools it, it, you need to have hands-on opportunities um, and some people can have that hands-on right in their own home so look at some of these indicators um, there are nice uh, responses I think um, on the quiet archives if you just go in and to the archives you don't have to join the list if you don't want to just go to the archives and type in administrative support and see what people have been talking about and sharing um, I would put a limit on your search because if you put in something very general it's going to go back to 1998 when the lists first started so i'd give yourself like a little five-year window maybe and see what people have written about administrative support in the more recent years um although you might want to know all the background stuff too how's that help all right and i go to presenter mode here um, some other places that you can get training on quiet I mentioned and I'll I'll try and find a link I was looking yesterday for a link to Gail and Denise's class maybe some of you that have been in the class can put that link in the chat um, but I wasn't able to find a current one um, and so some of the things that we've done um, to to teach people about quiet is we've done a 10-part series for um, AbleNet University. And if you used AbleNet University, you know all of their trainings are free. A lot of people think that when you go to AbleNet University, it's only going to be, <coughs> excuse me, on AbleNet tools, but it's not. It's on all kinds of assistive technology. There's sometimes I do trainings on there that I don't even mention anything from AbleNet. Um, they're very generous that way with their um, website and webinars. Um, so there's a 10 part series that covers in more detail all the things that I've tried to do in our um, hour here together. And then there is a three part series that kind of pulls it all together a little bit more practical. So I did a quick link this morning um, just to get you to AbleNet University and already with the search built into it. And then lastly, just reminders about the quiet website. Um, how to contact us um, you can always contact me directly if you want to um, information on the books and with that that's the quick quiet overview we'll see if we've got any more questions and I'm going to turn this over to Jen Hmm. I'm having trouble unmuting. So Cassie, go ahead, because I'm going to keep trying to unmute. Nope, you're good. Um, right now, there's no other questions that have come up. There's a lot of thank yous coming up, Kelly, but um, no direct questions beyond a lot of thank yous. I want to do a shout out to Kat, who put the information about Michigan Alt-Shift Project. Um, they have a lot of good information on their, their um, website pages. Um, and in addition, you know, um, Penny Reed got the old gang together last summer and they did go through the WADI, um, the assessment um, pieces, including administration and um, those kinds of things. So if you go to WADI.org, all of that is updated and downloadable and it's all free. I can unmute if I hit my pause button. So maybe I'll have to keep hitting pause for a minute. I don't know. Somebody, really... somebody just asked a common question, which is, is there a specific place to start? Um, I tend to start with assessment and implementation um, and look through those indicators. What's your assessment process? What's your implementation process? Um, that's, you know, quiet by Kelly. Um, some of the other leaders would probably might give you different um, ideas you know we all have our kind of um, torches to bear in assistive technology and my big one is implementation if you're not thinking about implementation why are you even buying anything 
Um, and so I go through assessment and implementation, um, and then that links you almost immediately to AT and the IEP. Uh, Jane Corsten would be interrupting me right now and saying, evaluation of effectiveness, um, because you need to know that what you're using is working, um, and those pieces. So those seem to be the big four. And then, of course, we add administrative support. Um, how are you doing your professional development? Um, the other areas kind of come in as, you know, the consideration process. Some, you know, a lot of times I'm in situations where people already have stuff. Um, that we haven't started from scratch. Um, and so I'm working with how did that get assessed and how um, is it implemented that people have already made the decision um, through consideration that this kid needed AT. Um, but some people will tell you to start at consideration. Well, you know, you're doing that. Okay. So but there are, there are indicators about how to do it well. Anna just asked another question, um, wanting to know how often you should reevaluate with these indicators. Um, a lot of it depends upon who's doing assistive technology in your, in your system. So, um, you know, with a typical school team, we do pre and post the beginning of the school year and end of the school year. Um, if there are multiple members of the team, um, if I have one member teams, I usually do it once every year. Um, and bringing an administrator in uh, to take a look at that. Um, if it's kind of like the one person, AT, you're wearing five hats person, which there are a lot of us out there. Um, but yeah, you know, twice a year pre and post for teams, once a year for individuals. Uh, Gail and Denise would probably tell you otherwise. I have to always qualify with what everybody behind me would say. <laughs> Any other now, questions? Now's your time. And you can feel free to unmute if you want to ask them or you can keep posting through the um, chat box. I think going through those AbleNet webinars will be good because you can, um, you know, go through, Kelly, are they um, organized sort of by each different area? So it kind of walks you through. So you could maybe watch them out of order, mm -hmm. maybe, and watch just those sections that, like you suggested, starting with um, implementation and assessment, start with those if you wanted, or you could watch them all in order as well. Yeah, that's a good example. There's 10 of them. The first one is an overview. The last one is resources. And the eight in the middle are the different areas. And, and maybe it would be something you want to view as a team and then talk about. So um, you could sit down um, and, you know, take each a little bit at a time. So maybe it's not so overwhelming. Um, or you could take a day and watch them all if you felt like it would be better to have sort of that whole um, overview. Um, but I think, you know, maybe that would be a great place to start. Um, trying to get all this content, like Kelly said, into an hour, there's just no way to walk everybody through forming a team. But I think the quiet um, indicators are um, definitely a big long process that you're going to go through. And so if you can use those, utilize those AbleNet webinars to help you walk through it individually um, as a team. I think that will that will allow you to really delve into it. Yeah, and the, the various AT leadership people have worked with, usually statewide projects. Um, Penny's worked with Arizona, and um, Jonah's worked with Minnesota, and Joyce worked with Texas, where we've taken in people across the state and all of the school systems um, and all of their different levels of provision of services through the indicators. Um, all of us have worked over the last three years with the Department of Education in New Hampshire. In fact, um, New Hampshire was the reason that there was a smaller book made from the big book. So they actually have a New Hampshire quiet book that's specific to New Hampshire um, that was worked on by four or five of the membership team. So people from the, the group are available to work with your individual school district if you want that kind of support. Um, or larger systems than that. Kelly, just thinking back to Wadi, has that ever been done in the past in Wisconsin? Uh, you know, I have to ask Penny, because I'm looking to see who's on. Dave, I'm now going to call out Dave. Dave, did you guys go through this with across the state? 
<laughs> Dave is probably like, why are you making me? <laughs> I'm here. Um, we had never gone through the um, quiet um, indicators through the state. Um, I think I remember it was communicated out there, but a formal process looking at all the schools or where the state was at, no, I don't remember that. Yeah, I think by the time that the indicators were completed, Penny was back in Oregon and there were other things taking over with what, what, what Wadi was doing um, and supporting. Um, and Andrea Bertoni, who is in charge at DPI of sort of that assistive technology area, she is a part of our um, group, our water and group, and I know she had another meeting when, but registered, so she, I don't know if she's on right now, um, but um, definitely I will um, bring that up to her. Um, and I know she's done some great work trying to advocate for assistive technology um, within DPI, um, and she's done some web, um, got together some webinars and different things like that. Um, so I will bring it up to her and I mean maybe that's something we want to look into is providing um, some sort of quiet support at the state level. Obviously, I mean I'm only me so I can't guarantee that um, but but I, I can advocate for it. Um, definitely if others are feeling like um, some, some sort of statewide support might be um, something they're interested in. Um, so and it may be, I'm going to do a shout out to Carolyn, um, who's just going to hear her name and be surprised. Hi, girl. Um, that it could be something that the CISAs are involved with, right? That that might be something that could work within the CISAs and get people within your regions to look at the quality indicators um, and the kind of support that you might be able to provide. Something that we could put out there, sure. Cool. See, it's bad if I know your name. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sticking other... around though. I'm sticking around. I don't know what room I'm going to go into. Well, we have a couple more questions and I don't know if these are specifically for you, Kelly, or more in general, but I'm going to throw them out while you're still here. Um, one was saying for schools that have an A-team, what professionals are on the team typically? Uh, I'll be tell you, I work across the country and internationally. It is different everywhere. Um, a lot of times teams get started from AAC or occupational therapy needs because we're looking at communication and writing. Um, but I will tell you that some that when we look at full rich teams, you really should have an educator on your team so that you've got people that are direct, directly connected to the curriculum. Um, and then I, one of the teams that I was on in Philadelphia, we had a parent on our team as well. Um, and that was very resourceful and helpful um, to us as we put together our presentations. Um, there was some, you know, we to have somebody on our team that was also, you know, that was also a parent of a child that used assistive technology. Sometimes we had parents that wanted to speak first with her because they were overwhelmed with professionals um, talking things to them. Other times not. So I think that, you know, some, it depends upon how your school system kind of starts it all, but start to look at the roles, that you've got people that have different roles and perspectives um, in their background from assistive technology. The other thing we've been advocating for, and especially the last five years, is getting your assistive technology team connected to your instructional technology team. Because decisions that are made on curriculum impact us with our student with our struggling readers with our kids that need asr that need us audio supported reading um you know and what curriculum decisions are being made and what technology decisions are being made um at your district um hold on you need to tell alexa to be quiet We have three people in our house that are running Alexa. So Alexa just got NPR everywhere. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, how, roles and responsibilities are, are varied. Um, there is no classic, this is what a team has to be. 
Kelly, I want to jump in. So um, we now have a monthly standing meeting with um, our IT department director. And let me tell you, that has been phenomenal. That relationship has really impacted a lot of the technology in our district. And um, our students are going to um, from here on out be receiving touchscreen Chromebooks and part of that has been through having that conversation of UDL and accessibility for all and I, I don't know that that would have happened I mean maybe just because the price of those has come down the district would have moved that way naturally um, but now I don't even think it's as much of a question anymore it's just that this is what we have to do um, so it can be really beneficial to have those meetings um, and including, you know, like that instructional um, and technology department in those meetings. And I know in our district too, we've paired with our um, with our IT instructional people um, to to do trainings too. And so, and, and our LMS staff um, and looking at accessibility features. Um, so some of those people that you don't think really would be a part of your um, AT team, and maybe they aren't officially, but you are having that continued conversation with them um, because our LMS really support a lot of the different um, learning tools that our students have access to. So if we can make them more aware of what accessibility features are built in, they can do a lot of teaching and, and support students um, with those accessibility, built in accessibility features. So it, 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 I mean, really think, think big when you're thinking about your AT team. Yeah. People are sharing really nice things in the chat, you know, about what they do at their district level, who comes in, how often they run the indicators. So um, if, you, if you're new to Zoom and don't know that you can save the chat, in the lower right-hand corner where you type your message, there's a little, you know, the little three dots that mean more. Click there and do save chat so you can um, reconnect with some of these folks or maybe here when we go into the Zoom rooms connect with some people that are doing the quality indicators in their district or they've already looked at bigger ways of organizing a team. It doesn't always have to be that you've got an AT coordinator. You know, sometimes it's a, a team of people from different perspectives or as somebody mentioned, they have somebody from each building um, that come together and discuss it. And there might be an administrator that takes some kind of a leadership role with you um, to make sure that your work doesn't go unnoticed or unimplemented. Okay, so I had promised everybody a, a break. That will give me some time. Please stay logged in if you want to participate in breakout rooms, because um, that will give me some time to coordinate the breakout rooms quick. Everybody can get up, get more coffee, get a drink, um, come back. Um, let's regroup at 1030. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay, and then if you have any more questions, feel free to post them in the comments and we can, when we come back, we can um, discuss uh, any more questions too.